So welcome to RCR Wireless News. I'm Martha DeGrasse. And September 10th is finally here. Apple's announcements going on as we speak. I'm joined by John Phelan of Argus Insights. John, thanks so much for joining us today. Glad to be here, Martha. Glad to be here. This is going to be a great day, I think. Yeah, um, we've certainly waited a while. And I think that... <laughs> You know, we're a little late getting started, but luckily so is Apple. Uh, I haven't seen I haven't seen much crossing yet. So while we're waiting, um, I think we should talk a little bit about some of the buying trends that you've seen um, leading up to this. Some of the people who have put off their smartphone purchases, waiting for the next iPhone. No, definitely. So one of the things that we track in the marketplace is uh, really looking at uh, how demand is shifting for the different handsets. And one of the things that we've seen as a bring that up here real fast. One of the things we've seen in the past before at big Apple launches or big Samsung launches on tablets or, or, or phones is a hiccup in the market, kind of a, the market takes a breath. And what you're seeing here is a, a comparison between Apple and Samsung, the volume of kind of consumer reviews coming in uh, along with kind of what the net sentiment around of that is. And what you see is that, you know, about, four, about a month ago when iOS 7 came out, people began to get unhappy with their Apple purchases. And the overall, we saw the buzz trends drop which is a clear indication that people stop buying iPhones or in, in the same kind of quantity they were before as they got ready for what was next. The interesting thing is that we also see the same hiccup in Samsung, especially in the past few weeks where although Samsung has announced a lot of new uh, handsets and the Galaxy Gear smartwatch and the Galaxy Note 3, we, did see, we are seeing people kind of going, but wait, what's Apple going to do? And it's interesting to see because we see this pattern in the past and in a couple of weeks once we have people actually using the devices and and are reacting to the actual um, uh, launch announcement in terms of what's coming out with the new iPhones we'll see whether or not Amazon, uh, I'm sorry, Samsung, Amazon customers too, who knows, um, whether or not Samsung customers will be swayed by the features of the new iPhones with iOS 7 combined or whether will they go back to uh, focusing on Samsung's uh, next generation products that we'll see later this fall. What's also interesting is that, again, the, the size of bubble is the, is the uh, relative buzz with, in the marketplace. This is kind of everyone else, and it's kind of anemic in comparison when you just think about the behemoths of Apple and Samsung. But what's interesting is that we don't see the same slowdown. We don't see the same kind of hiccup. And what it means is that the HTC, LG's, Motorola, Nokia, um, and even BlackBerry, they're even smaller than what's on here now, uh, of the world, those customers tend to be kind of immune to the moves of the big guys. They're niche players, they're niche markets. Uh, HTC's recent success with HTC One is really driving a lot of interest, and LG's hopeful that the G2 will bring them back into the fray. And you can see the recent bump for Motorola, mostly due to the Moto X, but even then, it's not all that and a bag of chips for people. And so part of what we're seeing in the marketplace is that it really is the two gorillas in the room duking it out. It's almost like the big scary mom Grimm, the blockbuster movie this summer, uh, and everyone else is kind of, the, to quote Jeffrey Moore, the little chimpanzees trying to get leftover banana peels. Um, and it's unfortunate because there are good products, there are good experiences out there, and you can see where, uh, most notably, Motorola and HTC's recent launches have really started to kind of catch up with consumers compared to kind of what we're seeing with uh, Samsung uh, and Apple in comparison. So it'll be interesting to see what happens today. We're already seeing people talk about how in order to combat what Google's doing with Android and Google Apps, uh, Apple made their uh, apps, uh, their kind of productivity apps, pages, numbers, um, et cetera, free, which is interesting. Um, you know, this is our kind of live, um, our live uh, kind of analysis of the, of the Twitter stream, trying to see what consumers are reacting to uh, in the overall speed piece. And we have these different anchor pieces. That's what's going on. And we're seeing, you know, there's some excitement about iTunes Radio, um, you know, there's people excited about when the actual iOS pieces will run out. Uh, they, they announced a date of September 18th, which has been kind of interesting to see. So I don't know. It's 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 shaping up to be an interesting event. I think one of the things that we found in our analysis of the launches for the 4S and the 5 was that there was a lot of excitement um, leading up to the event, but for the most part, the to quote my narr narrative theory from my English teacher in high school, there's a denouement. Uh, pretty soon afterwards as people kind of go, oh, that's it. So it'll be interesting to see what happens today. Right. All I'm seeing so far is um, is free apps, iWork apps, iPhoto, iMovie, uh, Pages, all of these free um, with any new iOS device. And um, they're calling these the iWork apps. So uh, 
It's interesting because uh, we were talking this morning with um, one of our contributors, the CEO at, at Centrify, submitted a piece about how Apple is really going after the enterprise market now, having um, seen you know Samsung really enter that space with the Safe Initiative and and um, really beefing up what they've done in the enterprise market and um, the fingerprint button that everybody's you know been talking about. A lot of us think of that as uh, a way to, you know, it's just a convenience or it's going to make it a lot faster to log into your phone, but it's also um, kind of a play for the corporate market because, you know, your your fingerprint is something that no one can copy, unlike a password. No one can guess your fingerprint. So um, this iWork an announcement kind of plays into that yeah, whole... It'll be, um, it'll be interesting to see, right? We're seeing increased adoption of um, iDevices across the enterprise. You know, notably with the bring your own device to work, uh, and the I mean I've seen I was at an Air Force base this past week and there were iPads everywhere um, because it's becoming the de facto standard. You know, you walk into a small business and they're using the iPad for um, for their cash register. You know, yeah. so it's we're seeing these devices show up in places that go well beyond you know watching Netflix and listening to to iTunes. And I think the rollout of, of fingerprint sensing will it will be interesting to see what happens because it was available on laptops for years but never really kind of got the, um, the uptake that we thought it would within that space. I spent some time in the touchpad industry in the past and we were always trying to figure out a way to, to add the fingerprint sensor along with the touchpad so you could kind of do all those things at the same time. And IT the IT folks loved it because they could have had that layer of authentication. Uh, but the users, they would rather type in the password. But when you go to a handset device, when you're trying to do this with your thumbs, usability-wise, I'd rather swipe my finger than try to fight with the touch typist to kind of get all those weird characters and things, um, especially as device security becomes increasingly more important. I mean, we carry our lives on these devices, and to be able to lock it, um, you know, just the pattern that we have on Android isn't enough anymore. My daughter's like, I know your secret pattern, I know your secret pattern. I'm like... Your seven, stay off my phone. So <laughs> it'll be interesting to see what the uh, what the fingerprint sensor does. Yeah, it looks like um, they've started with the five C, and ninety nine dollars with a two year contract, one hundred and ninety nine for the thirty two gig model. Ninety nine is the sixteen gig, I think. Um, four inch screen, bright colors, all that was expected. So that's interesting. They started with the five C. They have not yet talked about a new high end iPhone. So who knows if we'll even see that today or not. My my guess is we probably will, um, because they're at the stage now where Apple has to start splitting the portfolio. I mean, we saw this happen yeah. with iPods. We've seen it happen with iPads recently. I think it's time to start, you know, because they're getting eaten alive at the low end. And right now, the entry level iPhone for most people who are trying to get in the smartphone space is the free iPhone four, uh, which means. They're not going to be able to use iOS 7. They're not going to have access to the, that full experience of the, uh, the uh, iPhone ecosystem. And this allows them to actually spread out and, and create entry points, much the way the Shuffle did for a lot of people within the iPod ecosystem, right? Because at the end of the day, Apple makes money on their hardware, but it's the residual, residual income of having those people tied into the ecosystem is sticky and drives long-term revenues for them. And... But by not having a quality alternative to the low-cost Nokia's and low-cost uh, Android devices out there, they've been kind of seeding that part of the market to other folks. Yeah, it's interesting. They're giving. I mean, they're doing a lot for a $200 phone, A6 chip. Um, it is an 8-megapixel camera, so they haven't really upgraded the camera for this model. And um, yeah, it looks like. I mean, it, it's not. Um, it's got a bigger battery, I'm reading, than the iPhone 5. So it, it's interesting. I mean, the iPhone 5 is going to, I think, be very inexpensive now because typically, you know, the older iPhones are what people can get if they can't afford the new one. But now there really is a budget iPhone. Right, right. I mean, for $99, you're getting something. And I love how they emphasize console-level graphics, right? They're also embracing the fact that the these are, especially for lower cost, this is meant to be someone's first iPhone. And some level to disrupt the, the place that the iPod Touch has had in the marketplace. I mean, I, the number of parents I've run into who they have their iPhones doing this and their children have the iPod Touch doing this. Right. It's like, okay, it's everything. It's in my house. Right, except I don't want a data plan for them. 
And now they're like, well, it's only $99, and we'll get, a, we'll get you in that family bundle data plan. So we're seeing the right. ecosystem shift to enable uh, lower entry points for lifelong iPhone users is really what they're trying to do here, I think. Yeah. Well, I think that, um, it's again, it's really interesting that they started with the lower, I guess, you know, they're leading up to the big event, so we'll see. We'll see what they have to say next. But... Um, Says, I'm reading here that it's a green phone. There is a green version, but I think there's other colors too. But green in um, the environmental sense, arsenic-free, mercury-free, and Android-free. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one of the things we're seeing in the in the in the in the tweet piece is that the uh, colors that are getting the most resonance, you know, are are the green, the yellow. You can see this the size of bubble more so than blue. Um, you know, that's what's causing people to kind of go ooh. Um, and some get response around the Steve Jobs in terms of color. You know, it's it's funny to see how consumers actually respond to the data that's coming through. So uh, this what, is where, this is tracking like real time tweets that are happening right this minute. Yeah, basically what we're doing is we've identified a few anchor topics based on what people have been kind of excited about over the past little bit, and then we're finding those things that cluster around it. So obviously color is something that people are talking quite a bit more about. And look, we see. Uh, you know, green and yellow are staying, and something else is coming in on, you know, the white, pink, and the other pieces as well. Um, and so this allows us to kind of see, it's one thing to see what the gadget blogs are picking up on, you know, the experts that are tracking and professional Apple watchers. It's another thing to see how the market's responding to it. And that's what we're seeing here is kind of which things are getting resonated throughout the Twitter sphere. Yeah. So I'm wondering, you know, given that you said that we are looking at, at two gorillas in the marketplace, Samsung and Apple, if there is a high-end iPhone coming right after this, which of the of the things that Samsung has done over the past 12 months do you think Apple might pick up on? I, you know, Most people are saying they're not going to go for a bigger screen, but maybe they are going to go for better camera technology, or, or what else do you think Apple might feel like they have to, uh, to catch up, actually, with Samsung on? Well, it's interesting, because Apple's always lagged on the camera side. Um, in terms of resolution, and unfortunately, most consumers still kind of that's their main metric meter stick. I've got well, we saw that with the Nokia 1020, right? 41 megapixels of, of resolution. Yeah, yeah, Apple's way behind. You're right. Yeah, we're all way behind, right? The, um, the interesting about that is that what we've seen so far for a niche part of the marketplace, they love that device. It is actually one of the highest rated, uh, you know, window. It's definitely one of the highest rated Windows handsets in the marketplace today, but. Uh, and Samsung has always had more megapixels than Apple. It really comes down to whether or not the new Apple hardware combined with iOS 7 creates a new experience. Are they going to shift how they're doing the imaging piece? Are they going to integrate Instagram tighter? Because Samsung's been trying to compete on little small technology innovations like the eye gaze technology of the Galaxy S4. Some of our analysis of consumer responses to that found that only 5% even talk about it. And of that, over half of them don't like it, um, mainly because it eats the battery or it doesn't find their eyes behind their sunglasses or, or something. And Samsung's kind of practice of, of let's push on the technology without necessarily understanding what kind of experience it enables has hampered them in the fight this year against Apple. Um, and so it'll be interesting to see if Apple releases a shift in experience uh, beyond the shift in technology that we expect in these announcements year to year. I mean, more megapixels, more battery, Yes, that's just part of the course, but it'll be interesting to see what happens this year. Doesn't support LTE apparently, so I guess that's not that much of a surprise. Um, so you know, you have to wonder if there's going to be another budget iPhone tomorrow for China. Um, if this phone doesn't support TDLTE, then it's not a China Mobile phone, and we've been hearing a lot about Apple finally having a deal with China Mobile. So. I know there is another press event in Beijing tomorrow, so maybe that's when they might announce either a deal with China Mobile or a China Mobile iPhone or both. What do you think? I think a combination of both, right? Because you can't ignore the Chinese market. And I mean, not only that's where the phones are made, but they have kind of, over the past year, had several kind of debacles in how they've been interacting with China. Um, but they're doing a lot to try to regain some of the loss in social capital they've had within, within that nation. I mean, you, you've seen the recent press coverage outside of phones where, um, you know, the chargers were blowing up. People were buying knockoff Apple chargers, and uh, they'd caused several deaths. And so Apple basically said, bring it in, bring us your, your bad charger, and we'll replace it basically at cost. 
um, as a way to kind of gain uh, more credibility within that marketplace. And so it'll be interesting to see what happens. I, it's, okay. Radios are important. That there is a 5S. They've, they've announced a 5S, a 64-bit A7 chip, and I, there is going to be a gold one. I know there were a lot of pictures circulating last week of a gold phone. Right, the, the, the gold And it looks like the 5S will come in gold. Now, one of the things that we've seen, interestingly, over the different iPhone announcements, is that when Steve was driving the bus, it was always about what you could do with the device, what activities it enabled. But over the past two years, we've seen a shift where they lead with technology first, right? Where it's like, here, let, you, let us show you the exploded view of the camera. Here, we got billions of transistors on our 64-bit smartphone. Most consumers don't know why 64-bit is important. And so it's interesting to see whether this is an announcement for uh, the technology press or actual consumers. Um, so that's one of the shifts that we've seen over the years. And I hope at the end they do connect this back to how this technology enables a transformative experience for the user, because that's really what's driving adoption for Apple all these years. Yeah, I bet they will, because that was that was such a theme in their most recent earnings calls, you know, and that's sort of been um, their answer to um, losing market share. That um, they're not losing mind share; they're they're still the one that people want if they can get it, or that's what they like to say. So I'm I'm sure we'll see them make the case for the for the transformative user experience. Um, so let's uh, let's look at the Twitter feeds again. Are you seeing anything yet on the 5S on your data? Let me pull that back up real fast. Um, as well. Not a lot yet. It's interesting. I mean, there, there's still people talking about when things will be available, some interesting uh, side conversations around Steve Jobs. I think it's just now kind of coming out a little bit, you know, the people that are watching the blogs, and we'll see. There's always some delay as it comes into play. Um, we're still seeing side conversations around Apple TV, and yet that has not come up in conversation yet. And so um, it's these things lag a little bit as the consumer's going to go, what does this mean? Gold paint? I get to have a champagne colored? That was actually a strategy that, uh, <laughs> that um, Palm went through on the Palm 5. That was one of their, uh, uh, their SKUs in their portfolio was a champagne colored uh, Palm 5X. And then there's a special kind of pink champagne, Claudia Schiffer version, way back in the day. But that's that's going way back to the dark ages. Um, and so yeah, we're still not seeing the the five excitement come out yet. It's kind of interesting. Some of the colors come into play. Uh, I think part of what we're seeing here is, um, you know, the colors designed to match the the other pieces a little bit because we're seeing that definitely in and some of the screenshots that are coming across, right, in terms of the different color sets. I'm seeing silver, gold, and gray. No black, no white for the 5S. Just silver, gold, and gray. And no champagne. I think it's like a brighter gold. It seems like it. Um, more of a, but definitely <laughs> definitely a cold tone, which honestly I think is a big nod to the Asian market. Um, what we've seen in the industrial design trends over the years is that the more, um, for lack of a better phrase, bling industrial design styles tend to have, you know, shinier, tend to have greater, greater resonance in Asian markets than the U.S. market. Um, and so there may be that this becomes the, mar the phone they release in China, but there may be highly subsidized with China Mobile. It'll be interesting to see what happens there. Yeah, I'm almost, um, I really can't wait for tomorrow, so um, it'll, be, it'll be really interesting to see what, what they do announce in China. So, um, but yeah, clearly, uh, well, I don't know. To me, though, that was not a really bling, bright, bright gold, you know? I mean, That's true. It, we, it, it could be, right, it, it, this is not the chrome alloy spinner wheels, right? It's, we don't have that on the iPhone yet. But it'll right. be to see. Okay, I'm going to go back and, and check my feeds and see if there's anything new now. Um, a lot about the A7 chip, first 64-bit CPU. They're saying it's twice as fast as the A6 in graphics. Two times faster with gra is with graphics than the A6. Um, so it's probably going to be, I mean, performance-wise, it's probably going to be kind of unprecedented. And that's so, really, I mean, you know, we've um, we've heard a lot lately about, you know, the Tegra 4 and, and the Snapdragon, and, um, you know, it'll be interesting to see how this performs in speed tests. Um, I know that, that um, NVIDIA has claimed they've got the fastest chip for a while now, but um, it'll be interesting to see what happens next. Well, and, and almost more importantly for consumers, let me bring this up from, from our data. Give me two shakes here. Uh, it's the impact it's going to have on battery life. 
You know, because we look at what people talk about overall with the iPhone 5, battery still ends up being something that drives people nuts a little bit. Um, well, you know, yeah. It's like they love the product. We see that in the product passion being talked about. Uh, and they find it usable, but they found the iPhone 5 to be a little sluggish at times, and that the battery performance, you know, it's people found their 4s to be way better battery life. You know, it's it it, it continues to be a challenge. How do you balance, you know, speed with um, with the need to actually have it work all day? And so, you know, it's it'll be interesting to see what happens within that space because. People love the screen. They love the brand. They love the apps. You know, all these things are driving to it. But we still see complaints about battery life and about call quality um, across the board. Across the board, and so hopefully those will get addressed with the 64-bit. We'll see what happens within that space. Yeah. Um. Just seeing. Um. Black summer gold, high-grade aluminum. So that's very different than the plastic 5C. And um, yeah, um, it looks like that. It looks like he's still going, right? I'm trying to see if he's still on stage. Can you? I can't. I think he I'm is. Sti I'm still seeing things kind of come up, right? There, there's some pictures of uh, gaming demos. Um, they're playing uh, Infinity Blade uh, on the actual device, showing that going to happen in real time and showing the graphic quality. I wish they'd give... talk about whether they have a fingerprint sensor. There was so much buzz about that. I'm seeing pictures of, uh, oh, there's a home button on the right of the phone. Did you see that? Mm -hmm. I guess you can put the, on the right of the phone. You know how you use it at the bottom is the home button? They've got it on the right, it looks like. Which means maybe they've done something with the kind of the, the bottom button, and we'll see what happens. It's also interesting to see that the, the edges of cur the curves have changed a little bit. Sorry, I'm putting my industrial design hat on after, after my days at IDEO. Um, and so they're shifting the, the design language a little bit. It's subtle, but it's there. Um, and with all the conversations that we've had around enterprise, they're really pushing gaming. Um, it's like, okay, here's our cool technology, and this is going to allow you to play amazing games. It's almost like they're going after Sony and Nintendo as much as they are uh, Google and Microsoft. Yeah, it's going to be amazing. I mean, you know, they've already, the Retina display is, is already hard to beat, and now with the super fast chip. Um, I think it's going to be, uh, you know, I think it is going to be pretty stunning. I don't think that they've increased the screen size at all. I haven't seen four inches, but I'm guessing it's still a four-inch phone. Yeah, the the aspect ratio seems that way. I mean, the only way yeah, for I mean, it, it looks to get like it. bigger would be if the whole thing got bigger, and I don't see them going into phablet territory anytime soon. Right. Right. Well, the thing I think one of the things that that they've said, and and I would agree, is that with that Retina display, you you don't need um, as much screen to see quite as clearly. You know, I think you can see as well on the small iPhone screen almost as well as you can on the bigger Samsung smartphones because it's just so much sharper, you know? Yeah. So I think that they get they get a, a boost from that. And then, and, you know, they, they... Go ahead. And we find that the the um, the screen quality, the screen size doesn't matter that much for, for consumers. I mean, people who love their Galaxy Notes and that continues to be one of the highest rated phones in North America... Um, but when it comes down to it, whether you're watching Netflix on a mini or an iPhone or, or a, a phablet, it's not that much of a difference in, in comparison. Um, people basically, they like to watch their movies, whether they're small or big, they're going to watch it. I mean, I'm sure people are going to try to watch, you know, Netflix on the, if they could on the Galaxy Gear. They just want their MTV. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, um... And I, I don't think, you know, I think Apple really needs to push or wants to push the iPad. So they don't want to, I mean, the iPad is kind of a, a brand and an icon. It's still the best-selling tablet in the world. So unlike Samsung, that, you know, Samsung has a range and so many sizes and mix and match. But I think that Apple doesn't want to do anything to possibly cannibalize the iPad because um, that's the place where they still do dominate and hope to continue dominating is in the tablet market. I Although think I think right. their market share has gone down a lot in the past year. I'm sure you've, you've seen that as well. We, we have, and I think part of it was a pricing issue. You know, the experience gap is really closed between uh, the iPads and the other tablets out there. And, you know, at the same time, schools are saying, you got to buy an iPad. Yeah. Parents are like, can't we just get a aftermarket Android something or other instead? Yeah, yeah. Um, and as we talked about, I think it was about this time last year, when they launched the Mini, it was priced right above that of the iPod uh, Touch. You know, it was like sixty bucks more. Yeah. The iPod Touch was, you know, priced at three twenty nine. It was insane. And so, 
the premium that Apple can charge now for tablets is kind of shrinking. And we see that with the iPhone 5C, of them trying to make it easier to make to buy into the ecosystem. Uh, so the membership, you know, upfront membership cart charge is cheaper, uh, but then they have that lifelong piece. It'll be interesting yeah. To see. Um, so I'm just reading that uh, a little bit more about this A7 chip uh, motion coprocessor. Yeah, this M7 inside the, iPhones, inside the iPhone 5s M7. Oh, M7 chip. Okay. Right. Con keeps continuous track of subtle movements. It says. So I'm gonna, we should see what we can learn about that. And they're basically tying this back into Nike, and it kind of ties into the quantis, quantified self-movement that's been going on, so that your your iPhone kind of is your Fitbit, is your 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 jump, and it means that you can start to use it in different ways probably. Um, in the past, they've had chips from other manufacturers for them to take control over the whole piece. It's kind of a big change. Yeah, I know. It's a big change, and it's... Uh... Probably not that great news for some of their partners. Um, no. Makes me wonder whose IP they're borrowing for that. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, they're, um, they're, they're bringing more and more of the of the silicon and other components into their own wheelhouse, right? It's it's Apple's increasingly becoming vertically integrated. There's it's in the old days, Ford had the River Rouge factory where they brought in iron ore to one end of the factory and put out cars in the other end. I wouldn't be surprised if we start seeing piles of sand around their Cupertino headquarters to make their own chips. Inside. <laughs> right. Well, we haven't. I haven't seen that much yet about about the modems in either one of the phones. So we still don't really know about that. I'm, you know, they're probably still working with Qualcomm there, but we don't know for sure yet. Um, I did see one report even that they'll work with Qualcomm for a TDLTE modem for for China Mobile. So um, we'll have to see if if that plays out. But yeah, the the processors, you know, they're bringing it in, and I guess you know. It's not any surprise that that they don't want to rely too much on on Samsung for the for the manufacturing of that. I know that um, they've in the past turned to Samsung to you know to fab their designs, and they've tried to you know I've seen a lot of reports back and forth about working with Samsung, not working with Samsung, you know, going to Taiwan, not going to Taiwan. But uh, as far as the design of it, they've they've definitely taken that in house, and uh, it'll be great to. To learn more about the IP in the days ahead. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see, right? Because the uh, <laughs> that's been an interesting relationship since way back in the days of the of the iPod when Samsung was the primary memory vendor. Uh, it's it's a weird dance. It's a weird dance to see. Um, I'm seeing a little bit of coverage of the new camera, which is uh, trying to basically push the envelope in terms of the size of the sensor and. Uh, a really, really good size aperture in the grand scheme of things. So try to make it easier to take pictures on the fly. We've seen that happen more and more as, as people are replacing their kind of hand cameras with their phones. That the quality becomes interesting. There's been a whole movement of looking at clear pixel technologies and other ways to try to help with the low light challenges that you see uh, with the handsets. I'm interested to see what happens. I'm seeing a battery life report that says 10 hours talk time, that's 3G, 10 hours 3G talk time for the 5S, 8 hours 3G browsing, 40 hours of music, um, don't know how those numbers will change with LTE, Tw 250 hours of standby, so that's that's more than any iPhone we've seen. Now it's interesting because standby is a myth if you think about it, um, <laughs> especially with the way apps are today they're always kind of going, hey, I need an update. Hey, I need this. Hey, I'm yeah. looking at that. Especially with the notification integration. And the way we're seeing iOS 7 kind of align with the widget mentality um, and constantly running app mentality that we're seeing in Android and Windows 8, standby is a total myth. I find it humorous that they don't have L LTE talk time on there. Um, well, you know, it may be coming soon. Um, yeah, and, and back to the camera, the bigger pixels, that's that's like the HTC ones. So uh, that's sort of a, a nod to, you know, not more pixels, but bigger pixels. The same thing that HTC was talking about this summer. So that's that's kind of interesting. We'll see if if uh, if that becomes a trend now. And I haven't I, I haven't actually seen how many megapixels are on the 5S camera, have you? Um going through here, I'm seeing We know there's eight on the five C. Wait here, I bet this is gonna say it. Um better schedule for flash. Five element lens. 
2.2 aperture, LED flash. I don't know. It's interesting. They're kind of, again, trying to shift the conversation away from megapixels, which is good. Clearly, yeah. <laughs> they're not even going to tell us. And by but, the way, I mean, this camera you know, has three If you and I looked at pictures <laughs> side by side, would we really know how many megapixels were used in the camera to take each picture? You know, it's, it's no. just sort of like uh, something people like to talk about, you know? Right. It's, it's, it's the, uh, in the touchscreen days, we talked about how many fingers you could cram on the touchscreen. Uh, you know, yeah. At some level, it went up to like, we could do 15 and a nose. I'm like, but the screen's only three inches. How would you even, doesn't make any sense. And so right. it's, a, it's a false positive, to, to, for lack of a better phrase. And I think the other thing is, is that, you know, as you get the higher megapixels on your phone and all this HD video consumers are doing, you're filling up the memory quickly. Right. And considering that people are capturing and then using this data mostly on handheld devices, you know, uh, Acer launched the Liquid at IFA, uh, the new Liquid handset that's the first 4K um, video capture phone, which is amazing. But the, that given that quality of data, it's going to take a lot of memory on the device. You almost have to carry a backpack with battery and hard drive capacity when you have these like multiple megapixel cameras. And so I think seeing a shift, but first with HTC One, as you mentioned, but now with Apple, towards quality, really we want nice pictures. High resolution of, of poorly taken, washed out, oversaturated photos of our family and pictures at the bar where we're hanging out aren't as nice as like smaller resolution because yeah have the medium match the, the the device I think so I think so okay well we're coming to the end of the hour and I, I sense Apple's winding down as well but before we stop can we go and check your Twitter feed graphics again and see uh, what people are talking about a little bit sure definitely Let the screen no. go back on yeah while you do that I'm gonna check my feed that uh Slow mo, I see that now just crossed as a as a five S camera feature. Um, We've seen a lot of. Yeah, uh, I think you're really. You know, I I know that uh, a lot of people noticed Tim Cook wearing his fuel band at a recent press conference, and today it looks like they demoed Nike Plus alongside their M7 processor for fitness apps. So definitely, um, kind of addressing the wearables without you know launching a watch or anything like that. At least not yet. And it would almost make sense to lead with Nike first because of the brand recognition there. Um, you yeah. can imagine where that would be a better tie-in. And you know, uh, some of, some of other coverage pointed out the fact that Apple does best when they're not first to market. You know, I'll, the kids today think that Apple invented the MP3 player, but in reality, they had several years of learning uh, from the marketplace before they launched in that place. Same is true with the phones. And so, I think they're going to be kind of letting uh, Samsung and Pebble and others kind of figure out where the dragons are in the smart watch industry before they do anything too much. Yeah, and, and I really, it looks to me like like Samsung and, and uh, well, certainly Qualcomm, those are, I don't want to say loss leaders, but those watches are, are really meant, you, meant to get their customers interested in their other devices more than just the watch itself. So, um, right. I, They're meant to be part of the ecosystem, much the way the Moto Active was, right? It was uh, for at the kind of the tail end, but right before Google bought Motorola, they had their own smartwatch that was sort of trying to compete with the uh, Nike Plus and other things. Um, a very niche kind of following around the device and kind of played with the problems in terms of how the overall ecosystem worked. But, you know, they learned a lot in that space as well. It's now been discontinued. There's a new one, I think, around the corner potentially, but we'll see what Google decides to do with uh, that, that roadmap for, for right. Motorola. Okay, I have just a couple more updates to share. It looks like they're saying 10 hours LTE browsing and the same exact number for Wi-Fi browsing, also 10 hours. And um, that was actually just tweeted by, by Bill Ho, so thank you, Bill. And um, a little bit more on the camera here, auto image stabilization. Oh, and it takes, it takes multiple photos and then it puts them together and picks the best one. So you can you know, snap a bunch of photos and then you get one back that's the best shot. It does that for you. Okay, that's the way, uh, yeah, that was the big lead feature for BlackBerry when they came out with the BB10. Yeah. Um, and something that actually tr people really like about the Z10 handset is that ability to kind of do that replay and pick the right one. Um, yeah, so they've got that. Okay, anything else on, on your Twitter tool that people are getting excited about on social media right now? Well, we're seeing some kind of lags in here. We'd be seeing pieces around availability still for iOS. Um, 
some discussions around integration of TV t type things within the operating system as well. Um, you know, people are really excited about how iOS kind of has blended the overall all, overall handset, especially with the iPhone 5 coming into play. And a lot of discussion around color as it relates to the play between iOS 7 and the the handsets both on the C and otherwise. And so it'll be interesting to see how this kind of plays through. We'll continue to keep this up uh, all day. So as the market kind of starts to re respond to what they're seeing in, in the different feeds, we'll see that come as well. Well, it looks like um, in Cupertino, Apple is still talking about the camera. So um, I guess they're not finished yet. Oh, but it's, fingerprint reader. Here we go. What's that? I see it. Yeah? Uh, a minute ago. Passcodes are popular. The new Touch ID. Okay, they are talking about that. Okay, so we are seeing that come into play. They're talking about panoramas and... Oh, here, yeah, I see it too. Okay. Uh... Oh, that's clever. Okay, recognizes your thumb on the home button. Touch ID sensor, fingerprint sensor. Okay, so they are doing that. Well, that's good. So I guess, do you think maybe there's two home buttons? Because it looks like maybe this one's right where it always was, and then we saw one earlier that was on the right of the phone. So I mean, that would kind of make sense to have two ways to, to address your home screen. It, it does make sense, um, especially considering the different orientations that people use the device in. I think that's uh, that's going to be a big shift for them because you know if you're taking pictures or trying to go back to the home, you know sometimes it becomes awkward to try to reach your thumb around and do that. And if they've integrated the button and the fingerprint sensor, that's actually a pretty uh, trick piece of technology in the grand scheme of things. Um, my guess is it's some type of small capacitive sensor that senses the ridges in your finger and creates a picture of it. Think of it as the uh, the multi-touch touchscreen shrunk down to the size of a button with really high resolution is probably how they're doing it. And uh, as you said, I think for the enterprise folks, that's going to create a shift. And also for consumers too, right? Because if you can use this as a two-factor authentication, you get around a lot of the concerns that people have about NSC for mobile payments. Because anyone can take your phone and use the, chip, the RFID tag in there to kind of wave around and you know buy all kinds of things. But if you can combine the two-factor with a physical device this plus the fingerprint, point. you've got actually a really good mobile payment system. Yeah, that's actually a really good point. Yeah, it has to be you. So, uh, so yeah, that's that's huge. Um, let's see if it tells any more about uh, the technology behind that. So it's a sensor and a tactile switch underneath the home button crystal there at the top, just as we talked about. You can you touch it to unlock the phone or to make an iTunes purchase, which is actually really good. Uh, it's, you know, especially when you're starting to manage your, your presence across all these devices, you end up with not only personal security as well. I mean, when the Amazon Kindle Fire came out, one of the big things that Amazon went to do was to enable uh, one-click buying across the entire ecosystem which is great if you were the only one using your device, but for most people, um, tablets were shared. So in the early months of the Kindle Fire, parents came home to find their kids had bought you know, entire libraries of things that they didn't want, or videos or other things with their Kindle Fire, because, oh, one click. So having the close in the loop here with the uh, fingerprint sensor means I actually have a really good security system for purchase. Yeah, and it's interesting because we won't be able to um, ask another family member to grab our phone and, and check something for us anymore if, if we use iPhones and if we have. There was, there's probably a way to disable it, wouldn't you think, so that uh, you could? Yeah, I would guess so, right? Because, you know, there's, there's, you don't always want to lock your phone with your thumb. Right. Um, and you want to definitely have a way out of it, too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, because if I'm in an accident or burn my thumb, uh, you know, on the stove for doing something similar, um, I still want to be able to get to my phone. And so maybe you could put multiple fingers in there. But my guess is, um, you know, it'll be interesting to see if there's an Apple-style solution to managing multiple personas on the device, which may actually be something that we see in the next generation iPads, thinking ahead. Because we find that iPads are multi-user devices, and if you can imagine if you could right. do the persona shifts, they've talked about in iOS 7, where your thumb becomes your pass key to your, uh, you know, your experience ecosystem within the device. That becomes kind of cool. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's um, 
it's interesting, and and I mean, you you called it with the mobile payments thing. Um, it's not just everyone had talked about the fingerprint sensor as a security feature and a convenience feature, but it really is um, a brilliant mobile payments feature as well. So, and obviously Apple sees that too because they're enabling it for iTunes purchases, and uh, I would expect we'll see more purchases enabled by fingerprint sensor, wouldn't wouldn't you? I think so, especially. Um when you, you could imagine for companies like Square, if they can rely on the fingerprint sensor as a method of authentication within a use scenario, that closes that loop as well. So it's it has a lot of opportunities to really transform one of the key kind of barriers to mobile payments, and that's the trust factor. It's it a lot of these things end up with very complex ecosystems for how the users have to make things work. And NFC never really took off. Uh, a lot of money has been put in Google Wallet and uh, ISIS, but there just weren't enough handsets with enough uh, um, basically payment terminals that kind of enable that to make sense for folks. This really, I think, will change the game, especially given the ubiquity of iPhones within the marketplace today. I'm sure either Apple's got something that works or there's 17 startups right now all finishing their business plans to go out and build something around this. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think you're right about Google Wallet and, and ISIS. Um, and, and, you know, it's interesting because we saw PayPal this week, um, or maybe it was late last week, they updated their mobile app so that uh, it includes coupons. Clearly, they're, they're trying to give you a reason to pay with your phone instead of pulling out your credit card, which really is almost just as convenient, if not more so. So, um, it, you know, it would be interesting to see if, if PayPal and Apple end up competing, end up working together, because... Because those are two sort of, well, at PayPal's a very established way to pay. Apple is, is clearly, um, you know, a leader with, with uh, a lot of the biggest spenders in, in the economy, really. So it, it'll be interesting to see if how those play out. It seems like that the, the mobile payments landscape is, is really shifting a lot with, with these two developments. Well, and if you think about it, right, uh, people kind of view us iTunes credits as currency at some level, right? Yeah. And so, you know, you can imagine a situation where, I, you know, you're using your iTunes gift card to buy, you know, fruit at Whole Foods just because you have all the ecosystem. All right, we're seeing pricing come across. Oh, great. 16-gigabyte phone for 200, 32 at 300, 64 gigabytes at 400. So, you know, classic lower price points that we've seen in the past um, coming into play. They're showing some cases, you know. <laughs> Leather. They're... Uh, it's funny, Apple was not the first capacitive smartphone. It was the LG Prada that was launched three months before the iPhone was, and it came with a beautiful leather case because it was a Prada phone. And now we're seeing Apple have their own kind of leather case that comes into play. That'll be interesting to see. You know, com combine the gold with the leather, and we definitely see some things coming up where they're trying to take, at some level, the stitching that we saw in the, in the operating system in the past, tying it to reality, and bring that back to the outside of the phone, and take the abstractness of the, of the industrial design of the past and bring that into the phone. It's interesting. Yeah, let's get a look at it. Well, you know, it's gold, it's leather, and you can pay with it. It sounds like a wallet, but... Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, it says, I'm reading more about the fingerprint. Um, it's never available to other software. Your fingerprint is never available to other software. Never sent to Apple never backed up to iCloud. So um, it's, I guess that that means, you know, it's, um, I mean, it, it makes sense because, I mean, you, you did mention that you could burn your, phone, your finger on the oven, but except for that, you're not going to lose, hopefully, you're not going to lose your finger. So why would they need to back it up? So right. it's different. It's very different from other security in that way, I guess. And it's good that it's locally stored because that, that especially with the recent re revelations by the NSA and others in terms of the information that's being shared back and forth, People are concerned about that, right? If if your physical security can be shared that easily, um, that would drive people nuts, I think. Well, if it doesn't, it should. <laughs> but and the data, yeah. We see some interesting kind of responses to consumers to the privacy concerns, like the analysis we did of the Galaxy S4 with all the eye gaze stuff. No privacy concern, privacy concerns at all came up, which is amazing because in order for the eye gaze to work, it means that the video camera is watching you all the time. <laughs> Most people don't realize that's a privacy issue. So, okay. oh, we have a launch date. Yeah, September 20th, it looks like, right? Yes. Okay, so, um, yeah, is that a Friday or a Saturday? Let's see, the 24th, I know, is it Tuesday? That, that's, a, that's a Friday, I think, right? It is a Friday, yeah, that's next Friday. Yeah. 
Um, so that's uh, I guess that and that's for pre-order from what I'm seeing. So I don't think that means people can walk into the stores on September 20th, but you can pre-order it, and who knows how long it'll take to to get here from <laughs> Apple's website. But uh, welcome to the uh, to the uh, supply chain challenges. Looks like the 5C you can pre-order this Friday the 13th. Oh, okay. Um, Friday the 13th. That'll be interesting to see where that comes into play. And it looks like they're keeping the 4S, but we're not seeing any kind of continued availability of the 5. So they may be discontinuing the 5 uh, and pushing the, the 5C instead. Okay, the 5C is going to China, it says here. It says the 5C and the 5S, September 20th, the U.S., Australia, Canada, China, France, Germany, Japan, Singapore, and the U.K. That's from all things digital. So okay. I don't know if there's going to be a different China mobile iPhone, but the 5C and the 5S are going to China uh, a week from Friday, it sounds like. So that's happening. It'll, it'll be interesting to see if the radios in the, in the new 5S actually work better with Verizon. One of the things that we found that people distinguish between the old GSM carriers, the AT&T and T-Mobiles, and the Verizon, is the fact that you can talk and text at the same time. You can talk. Oh yeah, that's a big deal. Yeah, and the five on Verizon actually doesn't enable that at all. So it'll be interesting to see if the five S opens that capability again. Okay, check this out. The iPhone five is discontinued. It says um, there's still going to be a four S, but I guess they're not going to make any more iPhone fives. It it makes sense because you think about usually in the past the the latest generation slips to that ninety nine dollar spot. Right. And well, they're trying to that, that with the five C. <laughs> And, uh, yeah. yeah, it's it's quite covered. And honestly, given some of the vitriol we've seen poured out for the battery life and other things, it makes better sense for them to do that uh, than it is to keep around the iPhone 5, um, to use the 5C as a way to kind of take that middle tier spot. It'll be interesting to see. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah, okay, September 13th for the 5S. So do you expect, do you think there's another device coming next, or do you think it's going to end with the phones today? Uh, it, it'll be interesting, right, because they, they need to have a one more thing. <laughs> so far, the things that they have in here are some new technology, some pieces about the fingerprint piece, but the, there hasn't been like a, and the new this will actually change the way you approach this. And so Tim needs another there's one more thing moment because they haven't had one in a while. Um, you know, from the back to the I, uh, to the 4S, the, the the biggest trending topic at the 4S launch was iPhone 5. And people are like, but where's my 5? Oh, you get the 4S instead. And it'll be interesting to see where this is kind of going to play. So we're seeing some kind of bubbles coming through on the on the live blogger saying that there might be one more thing. They need it as Apple. Right now, what we're seeing with iOS 7, with the 5C, we're seeing blocking and tackling. We're seeing a company who's mature to the marketplace and realizes that they have to shift their strategy in order to stay competitive and maintain that mind share. The question is, are they going to offer something that shifts from maintenance to actually growth? Because um, as we saw in the data I was showing before, Samsung is the alternative right now. And, and the bulk of the market is waiting for both of them to do something that really changes their lives. And, you know... It's not hasn't really happened yet. We're seeing, I mean, as you said, the camera looks like what HTC One's doing. The software features around the slow motion, other things. It looks like what um, what uh, what BlackBerry did, you know, months and months ago. And so, the fingerprint's nice, but there there have been handsets that um, kind of did. Uh, had fingerprint sensors in Japan for several years ago. Authentech and Validity both had hands, uh, sensors and handsets in the past in Japan for some of these same kinds of things. And so, you know, it'll be interesting to see what happens. And we haven't heard about the iPods yet, right? Traditionally, they've kind of grouped those things together. Maybe there's something new coming with the iPod space. Maybe they've totally decimated iPods and created the iWatch instead because, honestly, the, the small uh, Nano looks like that anyway. So <laughs> we'll see. Yeah, we'll I think see. that um, if they do have the one more thing coming, they may they may be saving it, you know. And and again, who knows? Well, I don't know. They um, they do have an event tomorrow, but that probably wouldn't be another consumer device launched in China. 
Although it's really, really interesting that you know for the first time ever they're they're launching their new iPhones, both of them in China, the same day that they're launching them in the rest of the world, and yet they still haven't said whether there's a TDLTE phone that works with China Mobile. So we'll just have to to wait to find out about that. My guess is that'll be a little more localized. The other thing that's interesting is that last year they hit us with two events, right? They they did the um, they kind of spread things out a little bit strangely and shifted everyone's expectations so that they had the tablet launch in October, yeah. um, which most people expected in March. And so my guess is there will be another chance for them to kind of come into play with an October event, similar to last year, to kind of prep the holiday season around iPads. But it will be interesting <laughs> to see whether or not the... the oh, I'm sorry. I was, I was laughing at something I, that came up on my Twitter. Oh. I'm sorry. <laughs> What'd you see? What'd you see? It says the. Um, it, I think this is our answer to the one more thing. It says that Elvis Costello just took the stage with Tim Cook, and he's the one more thing. So <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, I don't know if he's going to announce something or sing, but he's apparently on the stage. Uh, Elvis three has minutes ago. Building. So we'll just we'll wait for a second and see if if that's the uh, wind down entertainment or if there's actually another product. It's a musical guest. Close out the show. We'll see. It's interesting. Um, They've done that in the past, right? They had Pooh Fighters on several occasions. Yeah, later today we'll have the kind of the minute-to-minute -minute kind of analysis, and we'll be able to compare that to the past launches. Um, we we're, were able to pass and kind of see how the different parts of the conversation drive different kind of volumes of, of, of reaction in the marketplace uh, within the Twitter piece. That's one of the ways that we're able to kind of see, all right, they like this, they didn't like that. Um, we'll see what happens. But yeah, it's. I guess what's interesting is that, for the most part, it's everything people expected. <laughs> I mean, did you find anything surprising so far, Martha? Um, again, just the fact that um, they have yeah you know, the, the twin launch with China. It kind of leaves you wondering. I guess tomorrow is is really just for the people in China. There's probably nothing new tomorrow since this is already launching in China at the same time. And then, um, you know, just I was, I'm, I don't know if I'm surprised as much as just interested in realizing what they're doing with the fingerprint sensor and iTunes. That's, uh, I think that's brilliant and it'll be, you know, it, hopefully they'll extend it to, to other merchants as well because that does sound like a, a really elegant mobile payment solution. I think so. I, I've had a belief for a long time that anything that required biometric information was a much better security system than all the other things that we're trying to force some people over the past several years. Um, yeah, and you know, I guess the A7 chip is actually another surprise. That was, you know, nobody really talked about expectations for the chipset, but clearly it's, it's an area of focus. And as you said, Apple clearly wants to be uh, bringing, bringing that in-house as much as possible. So that's something that I think is a little bit of, of a surprise. Well, it's interesting because um, to contrast with the Moto X, so Motorola ends up with multiple cores in the Moto X to kind of enable the experiences there. And they actually have a, in order to enable the Google Voice more rapid kind of integration, they've got okay, a dedicated yeah. kind of voice detection uh, piece of silicon on there. Whereas Apple, we see, has a dedicated motion piece of silicon. And so it kind of tells you where the company's heads are at, right? So, it, you know, Moto, Motorola's trying to make it easier for their phone to understand what you say. And Apple's trying to make it easier for the phone to understand what you're doing. And so that kind of telegraphs to what they hope to be taking the handsets to do and drive for some very different experiences for the development community to kind of push on. Again, Apple's pushing gaming. Um, the motion piece could do some interesting contextual things that, you know, we see Samsung trying to do with the eye gaze and other stuff. But we haven't really seen... Apple trying to do a lot of contextual sensing to make the phone smarter about how it interacts with you at the right time at the right place. And you're seeing some fun stuff. Share, 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 oh, share. I'm sorry. People are just, um, yeah, AT&T, um, they've got their own announcement in the middle of the Apple event um, supporting 700 megahertz interoper interoperability. And um, I don't think it's a coincidence that they announced it right now. But, uh, but yeah, that's, that's crossing now. There's less and less on my feet about Apple and more and more about AT&T. So I think that might be a sign that Elvis may be singing, but not um, not doing anything that we need to report about. What do you think? Yeah, I think so. From what I'm seeing on things come across, there's there's music going. Um, uh, yeah, the, I'm seeing some people say it would be nice if there was some kind of surprise at the end, like a post-credits teaser at the end of the Avengers movie when they go out for shawarma. 
you know, but I'm uh, my guess is that uh, well, Elvis has not let yet left the building, but but Tim may have. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I, I think we're safe to leave. Uh, I think so. If there's something, if there's something else that we missed at this, we will tweet it. And uh, this has been great. I think that uh, we will see what develops. But I really appreciate your time today. It's been fun to cover this with you. Vice versa. This has been great. We should uh, set it up for October when they release the other products coming out. That'll be great. Yeah. Let's do that. Okay. Okay. All right. Great. Right. All right. Thanks, John. Have a great afternoon. Thanks, Martha. You too. Right. Thanks everyone Bye. who tuned in. Appreciate it. Bye. Bye.